Hello. Well, today we're going to be talking about networking architectures. Keep in mind that networking is what keeps the internet together and what keeps us in touch with our friends and family that are not exactly in the same geographical place as we are. Okay, so let's get started. Well, from networking architectures, we're going to look at two different network architectures that are the most widely used. First of all, we have the client-server architecture, and then we have the peer-to-peer -peer architecture. So we're going to start with the client-server. Now, as you may suspect, in a client-server, there is two kinds of computers. The clients, the ones that play the role of clients, and the ones that play the role of servers. Okay? Now, the server acts as a central point that will coordinate all the services and the resources to other nodes on the network, namely clients, right? And the server is going to actually provide access to them. Now, there is another thing. Within this, the client and server network, we know that the server is going to control the resources, right? However, these networks are better suited for large networks, you know, not at home, certainly, and it is because there is a high cost to install and maintain. So you may think, well, if it is so high cost to install and maintain, then why would you want a client server architecture? Well, just like we said, right, the server is the one that has the control of the resources. It may have control of the resources that are within the server, or it may act as a gateway to control access to resources that are behind it. And it's figuratively behind it because you, um, you're saying, I'm saying behind because your a request as a client comes to the server and the server says yes or no. And if it allows you to go through, it lets you pass through behind and get the information that you need to bring forward, you see? So the server is like a gatekeeper, okay? So the server guards the information, the server pro provides services. In most, kinds of, in most cases, the services are to provide some information, okay? So for this kind of network, we have two, two kinds of computers or computers that may look exactly the same, but they play different roles. One role is a client and the other role is the server. The server always, always, 100% of the time needs to be up and running up and running. For example, every single time, day or night, that you click, you go to, you go in your browser and you go to amazon.com. Amazon.com doesn't close at night, it's not sleeping, right? It's a server and the server has to always be looking and listening to see if there's any requests from clients. In this case, you will be the client, your computer will be a client and it's gonna go to the server, Amazon namely, right? And say, hey, you know, give me your, when you click on Amazon.com, you are automatically requesting from the server to send you the home page of, of that particular URL. So you send it in, you know, you send it in. And then, so basically, the, the server replied to your request by granting you access to the information that is in that page or in any other page that you have actually clicked on. Okay, so now this is a very simplistic example of a client server, but that's exactly how they work. Okay, so the server has the power. Usually it's not a computer that looks like the client. It's beefed up because it has to be up all the time. And some of the times, and maybe somebody else is going to talk about this, you don't have just one server, but you have many servers that act like if they were one. Imagine if Google had only one computer that would be the server, that would be terrible because when that computer burns out, then Google is down and Google is never down, right? So what you have is a farm of servers and you don't even know which one you access, but you ask for your request to a server and the server gives you an answer, okay? So this kind of architecture is a little bit more complex to set up, but it provides you, if it provides you with control. If you can control the server, then you can control who has access to the information that the server serves, okay? Or the information that it contains, or the services, products, or anything that the server provides, okay? So this is very good for corporations and for organizations. And as I mentioned, you know, every single website is hosted in a server, okay? So that's how your client-server architecture goes. 
However, it is not the only uh, architecture that we know. Let's take a look at another one. So we have the peer-to-peer -peer architecture, okay? Now, this is distributed, namely that not all the information is within the server. It's distributed among the peers, okay? And they are all kind of the same. It's more a democracy, okay? And uh, the sad thing is that in this case, it's going to be very hard to keep control. So, if this is so hard, and it's hard to keep control and stuff like that, who uses it? Well, the answer is that you do, we all do. We use peer-to-peer -peer networking when we're at home. So whenever you're setting up your network or accessing your wireless or you know, setting up your computer or your dad or uncle or your auntie is setting up the computer for you, what's happening in there is that they are connecting you to a peer-to-peer -peer network where your computer and your auntie's computer and your sister's computer, they are all linked to the same network and they have equal privileges. No one of them is a server, right? So I could share information with some, they can share information with me, but there is not really a gateway saying like, oh, I'm the server for the Polo family and I won't let you access certain things, you know? So this is more like for easy networking and stuff that you keep, you know, at home. It's hard to keep control, yes, but do we really care? You know, we are in an environment where mostly <clears throat> we share the network, but the idea is that I connect somewhere to a server and then I get information um, through, I ask for, I request something and the server grants me something, okay? So I can do that from a peer-to-peer -peer network. I, whenever I am within my peer network, you know, within my home only, then I am a peer and all the other computers within my house are peers to my computer. So this is a peer-to-peer -peer network. Whenever I want to access the internet, namely to go to amazon.com or apple.com, I grab my computer and now my computer is playing the role of a client to interact with a server that is located somewhere else, okay? So once you say that your computer is a, a peer or is a client or is a server, that doesn't mean that it's a role that you can play forever. You know, it depends in which computer, in which network you're, you're located and which other computers you are talking to or relating to, okay? So that's, that's how it goes. However, you know, for a peer-to-peer -peer network to work, you don't really have much of a problem because if you get a computer, it always comes with an operating system already and most likely there are some things that you just have to activate and set up your network with your SSID, you know, with your things for your network, but basically all the software is already there. But what happens when you want to have a server? Servers are a little bit different. Let's take a look at this. Servers are going to need specific operating systems and I am just going to list a few of them. We have Apache, which is the most widely used operating system for servers in the world. Then we have Linux. After that, we have Windows Server and Mac OS Server. So, all of these are used around the world. However, open source, like Apache and Linux, are the most widely used because you can adopt, well, companies feel free to adopt the software and then if they need to move something, they are able to do it because it's open source. So that gives a little bit of an edge, okay? So after talking about this, we let's go back and think about the internet where all the computers talk to everybody and you kind of have a lot of servers and a lot of clients talking to each other. But what if we have a network that I only want certain kind of people to access. Let's take a look at that. What I'm talking about in here is I am talking about intranets, okay? And what it is, is a network within an organization. For example, here at Leeward Community College, we have an intranet, and that intranet allows me as faculty member here to access some resources that are for faculty and staff, and they are not for everybody else in the world right? So it's protected. I have to log into it so that I can have access to that piece of the network, to those services, and anything that I need from that internet is like a private internet. You can look at it like that. So let's take a look at other kinds. We have also the extranet, okay? And the extranet 
is an intra-organization network, meaning that it's for more than one organization and it provides limited access to resources and services that you can offer. In this case, for example, with extranets, now it is not just within my company, like in the internet, but in the extranet, you're talking about two companies that are sisters, sister companies. So they kind of work together a lot, right? So because they work together a lot, they, there is information that they want to share. It's not within the internet because the internet is only within here and this one has their own internet, right? It's not in the internet because then everybody and their dog will have access to that, but it's an extranet, which means that some of the resources that are particular and private for this particular network and some of the ones that are over here, they are shared among themselves. So they can access this, the people in here can access some things in here, and this one can access some things in there. So it's private, but not quite private. It's semi-private, because both of them have access to that. So that will be the extranet. So now, let's just review that. The internet, public, everybody can access it. We wish they wouldn't, but they indeed do. Okay, intranet that it's private to a particular organization, and then you have the extranet, which is shared information, you know, among more than one, at least two organizations. Okay, so with that, I let you on the internet. See you around.